Greetings. My name is Kate Rademacher, and I'm here with Writing for Your Life and Compassionate Christianity. I'm just so thrilled. We've already been giggling before we started recording. I'm just so thrilled to be here with one of my favorite humans and one of my favorite authors, Carl McCollum. Um, I've been a fan of Carl McCollman. Sorry. And we practiced before the recording, Carl McCollman. Yes. Do you want to start? Do you want to start from this Let's top again? It. Let's just keep it. They want to see okay. our. <laughs> so I'm here with Carl, and I'm one of, um, as, as I was just saying, he's just one of my favorite people on the planet. And we we uh, we always have fun when we see each other in person and when we chat on the phone. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation, especially because Carl is about to launch a new book, which is actually a revised book. And we're going to have a drum roll. Can you show us the... Da -da. All right. So Carl, can you tell us, first of all, um, you know, please repronounce your last name since I butchered it. And can you um, just tell us a little bit about yourself in general, but also about the, the title of the new book and, and what the, you know, how it came to be. I know the backstory, but share the backstory. Sure, sure, sure. So yeah, so Carl McCollman, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Scottish name, you know, probably my family you know, they were they were probably whiskey makers and cattle rustlers back in the day. So, you know, I come from a long history of troublemakers and miscreants. But um, the um, my story, you know, very much kind of, you know, mid 20th century, middle class, American childhood, white, you know, suburban kind of a gig had a um, kind of a spiritual awakening when I was about 16 years old. Um, took a, was, was raised Lutheran, took a detour into the charismatic world, kind of had some issues with the theology there, uh, eventually found my way into the Episcopal Church, from the Episcopal Church, found my way into Wicca and goddess spirituality, and I did that for a number of years. Um, from there, I, I realized, you know, I just, I love Jesus, and, and there was kind of a Jesus deficit in that world. There's still a lot that I love about earth-centered and nature-based spirituality, but, you know, Jesus is my, my man, so, you know, I had to, um, I had to reconnect with a more traditional Christian context, and I chose Catholicism at that point, mm -hmm. primarily because of my love for, for mystical and contemplative forms of Christianity, which historically have been associated with monasteries. You know, if, if I lived in Poughkeepsie, New York, I would probably still be an Episcopalian because there's a wonderful Episcopal monastery 20 miles north of Poughkeepsie. But I live in Atlanta, Georgia, where the nearest monastery is a Catholic monastery. And so, ipso facto, became a Roman Catholic. And of course, now I hang out with the Jesuits a lot. So not only the Trappists, but the Jesuits. And uh, to put a bow on this, I have also, since graduate school, have had a longstanding interest in, in Buddhism. And so I'm also a student of the Dharma. I do work with a Dharma teacher and I do sit fairly regularly with a Sangha here in Atlanta as well. So kind of following in the footsteps of Thomas Merton, you know, and other figures like that. I, I'm, I'm anchored in Christianity. That is my home faith. But there's a kind of a helping of the Dharma on the side. So, so that's me. The book. Um, whoa, where's the first edition? Ah, there it is. So the first edition of this book is called The Big Book of Christian Mysticism. It came out, oh, let me put it back so you can see the whole thing. It's got a beautiful cover, although the cover of the second edition is much better. Um, the, came out about 13 years ago now, in 2010. Uh, the, the short story there is when I was uh, between college and graduate school, because it actually took me a couple of years to read it. I read the book Mysticism by Evelyn Underhill. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those books that just opened up you know, opened up my spiritual life. It was so formative for me, uh, really introduced me to the contemplative tradition within Christianity, introduced me to the major mystics, people like Julian of Norwich, John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, um, you know, up to 1911, which is when Underhill was writing. So it doesn't talk about some of the more recent figures like Teilhard de Chardin or Thomas Merton or Howard Thurman or Simone Vea, but the historical, the historical tradition is all there. So it really, um, you know, I, I mentioned having that kind of spiritual awakening when I was 16. It helped me to to kind of frame that and to be able to to kind of position that in my overall spiritual life. Just a really, really important book. But, but like I said, it came out over 100 and now 112 years ago. So even when I read it in the you know late 70s, early 80s, it was already somewhat of a dated book. And so I think I always 
kind of had this ambition as a writer, it would be so much fun to write kind of a contemporary love letter slash response slash continuation of Evelyn Underhill's book. And that's what my big book of Christian mysticism is. Now, I don't like the title of the book. It's not really that big of a book. It's like the, the Stonehenge uh, uh, set design in Spinal Tap. It, it, it sounds bigger than it really is. So, um, so almost from the beginning, I wanted you know, to, to write a bigger book. I wanted, there was things that, that I left out of the book that I felt needed to be in the book. You know, as, as time went on, not that there are any errors in the book, but there are gaps. There are gaps that really needed to be filled. So, um, so you know, as, as you know how the publishing industry works, it just turned out that a couple of years ago, the publisher of that book actually sold the rights to a different publisher, the publisher that I actually am with. They had published my most recent book, Eternal Heart. And when they bought the rights to it, uh, first thing I said was, let's do a new edition. And they said, absolutely, we would like to see that. And so, so I've been working on it now, probably about three years. And it's exciting because, you know, in the next about, what, 10 or 12 weeks, it will be published. So. So I'm very, very thrilled. So again, new, yeah, hold up the new one. Uh, it's so the, beautiful. This cover yeah, is the, so gorgeous. The, the new cover is just, I think, very current for today. It is, you know, the old cover was kind of like more architectural. This yeah. is more people centered. Yeah. Um, it, it has more of an inclusive or diverse feel to it. Of course, it's art. It's colorful. It feels alive. So I'm just really, really thrilled with the cover. And again, the title, you know, this is this is my my journey into patience. So the new big book of Christian mysticism, I think it was inspired by New Seeds of Contemplation um, by um, by Thomas Merton. Uh, it, it's not my first choice, but but it works. It works, you know. So if anybody from from my publisher is listening in, it's a great title. But um, <laughs> The, um, well, the, I like I the think, title. I yeah. I like it. Yeah. I think it's I think it's fun, and it it's slightly I don't know not you know not a not irreverent, but there's a little like slight um, cheekiness to it or something at least for me. And I think that's um, one thing I love about you as a person, and one thing I love about your writing is you know bringing some bringing joy, bringing some lightness to the situation. You know, these are heavy topics we're thinking about right. God right. and the meaning of life and you know so um i'm and and i was just saying before we start recording i i was first introduced to this book when i was preparing for baptism about a little over a decade ago and your book meant so much to me then and continues to mean so much to me so i'm both incredibly honored and privileged to be interviewing you about the new the, the new revised version and i'm just so grateful that it's that it's coming so thank praise god thanks be to god for all of your work and for this ministry that you provided um, one thing I love about your writing is sort of you make, at least me, I think probably most of your readers feel like mysticism is available and accessible to us. Mm -hmm. And so as someone who has, I think, mystical, at least leanings or tendencies, can you, um, sorry, I got a little background noise. We're having, we can include our bloopers here. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk about what you what you see as a mystic and what the criteria are, perhaps, if that even makes sense for what it means to be a mystic? Well, it's a fraught word, and um, you know, I know I know scholars and I know other spiritual writers who just flat out don't like the word and think the word should be scrubbed from our vocabulary. And I can kind of appreciate where they're coming from because it is a word that over, for one thing that's interesting, fun fact, it's not that old of a word, mysticism, mm. only dates back to like the late 1600s. So it's a word that kind of is related with kind of the rise of modernity. And, and as it was originally developed, it, 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 it's, it's a loan word from French. It, it shows up in France, I think in like the 1690s, it, it shows up in English around the 1730s, 1740s. So really right on the cusp of the enlightenment, you know, the scientific revolution, that whole kind of thing. And the word originally shows up as, as a put down. It's a negative, you know, um, mysticism. It's, it's, you know, it's fuzzy thinking, it's woolly, it's illogical. And so it, um, you know, it's like you have science, which is rational, clear headed, empirical, 
you know, evidence-based, falsifiable, and then you have mysticism, which is just ooey gooey, <laughs> woo woo is what we would say today, you know, it's all the, you know, and that that kind of stuff. So, so you know, that was kind of the the heart of the word, and then, um, in as we move into the 19th century, the word gets kind of adopted in the esoteric and occult world. So you have this idea of mysticism as being related to the occult, to magic, to um, divination, astrology, tarot, those kinds of things, uh, which, you know, if anything, makes the word even less savory maybe in a Christian context. But then towards the end of the 19th century, you have, and, I, and I'll only speak about in English, I'm sure in other languages, it would be different figures. But in English, you have three authors who really together kind of give the word more of a Christian kind of a kind of a meaning. And those authors are William James, of course, known for the Varieties of Religious Experience, which is published right at what the year 1900, right at the turn of the century. Evelyn Underhill, who I previously mentioned, the Anglican writer and authority on spirituality and mysticism. And then um, uh, William Inga, who was a, um, a, a priest in the Church of England. Oh, and then there's also um, uh, Baron Friedrich von Hugel, who was Evelyn Underhill's spiritual director, who wrote, a, who wrote a fairly important book called The Mystical Element of Religion. And so what these authors start doing is really kind of trying to reclaim the concept of mysticism that no, this actually is a useful term, a useful category for the spiritual or the supernatural dimension within Christianity. And I think, you know, we have got to keep in mind they're writing at a time when Christianity is really kind of playing defensive against kind of logical positivism and the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution. There was really kind of this idea in the air at that time that Christianity is really meant to be just about, you know, learning to be good and moral people or working to feed the poor, working to feed the hungry, but it doesn't have any real claims to any kind of a, you know, metaphysical or supernatural or, uh, you know, anything beyond what science can, can measure or, or interrogate is not important. You know, and so I think this is what these early authors on mysticism are really trying to, they're trying to say, no, wait a minute, that, that, that interior, that transpersonal, and, and I'm using some contemporary language, this is not language they would have used, mm -hmm. those dimensions matter, they, they matter in the spiritual life, that the stories that have been told consistently, generation after generation, century after century, is that people who really engage with the project of Christianity, which means engaging with the sacraments, engaging with the spiritual practices, engaging with learning to read, to read the Bible in a meditative way or doing the daily office or those kinds of things, have meaningful and consistent experiences of God. And so, um, so that's where kind of this, this renaissance of the word mysticism kind of occurs. But again, what happens is there's still all these different meanings. And then, of course, by the time of the 1960s, and you have the countercultural movement, the hippie movement, the Beatles running off to India to study with the Maharishi, mysticism then gets tagged into Eastern spirituality. So, so mysticism, and I think a lot of people today, they hear the word mysticism and they think of yoga, they think of Zen, of Taoism, of Vedanta. You know, those kinds of things. And then if you say, but wait a minute, there's such a thing as Christian mysticism. They're like, huh? You know, it's just, it's really just not on the map. So, so I think that's why for many Christians, mysticism remains something of a dirty word. But for those of us who, again, kind of follow in the Von Hugel, Underhill, uh, Dean Inga, uh, William James tradition, we think that, that it, it's a viable way of indicating that there's more to Christianity than simply the external form. So it really does represent a, um, a meaningful engagement with the interior life and understanding that the interior life is not something separate from the exterior, we can talk about that, but that it is vital and, and Christianity isn't Christianity without that. So that was a long-winded answer, but there you go. Well, that's, I mean, and what you say about Christianity wouldn't be Christianity without that. I mean, that seems so true. And so then it begs the question, you know, 
does it make sense to call out this quote unquote mysticism? And so maybe actually, let me fold in another question and you can think about that while I'm asking the other one, which is perhaps it's best to like apply, um, to ask this in the context of one of the people I know you added to your book. So my understanding is from the, in the new revised version, you include reflections about Howard Thurman. And so I'm, you know, he was obviously an amazing figure and maybe you can summarize who he was for those who don't know, but then also how, why do people, why do you consider him to be a quote unquote mystic? Right. Well, and, um, you know, and so my, my list of, of, um, you know, kind of mystical agitators grows again because Howard Thurman, one of his mentors was a man named Rufus Jones. And Rufus Jones was also, he was a Quaker and also an early scholar of this kind of category of Christian spirituality that has come to be known as mysticism. So, um, so Jones mentors Thurman, who was uh, a Baptist preacher. He uh, grew up in Florida, grandson of a slave, African-American goes to college here in Atlanta. Um, in fact, he's interred at Morehouse College. So, um, you know, and then went to a seminary up north, I think in Rochester, New York. Eventually then does like uh, some independent study with Rufus Jones, who really helps Thurman to kind of reclaim, and I, now I'm gonna introduce another word, the contemplative dimension of Christian spirituality. And so contemplative is another fraught word, like, like mysticism. It gets used in different contexts with different shades of meaning. But the meaning that I'm using here is uh, a spirituality that is steeped in silence, a spirituality that is steeped in a gesture of consent to listen and trust the action of the Holy Spirit within. If you want a biblical anchor for that, Romans chapter five, verse five, hope does not disappoint us for love has been poured into our hearts through the spirit who has been given to us. And of course you can pair that with first uh, John chapter four, which the only time in scripture that God is defined, God is love. God is love. That's the only time the Bible defines, attempts to define God. So if God, if love has been poured into our heart through the spirit that has been given to us, clearly what, what Paul is making is a pretty strong statement that we find God within, that, that, that God is resident in our hearts. And, um, and I, let, let me just throw this in, another significant figure uh, in kind of the renaissance of mysticism, a woman named Carol Hauslander, a Catholic woman who lived in, um, in, in England. She died in the 1950s. And she wrote a wonderful book on, on the Blessed Mother called The Read of God. And in that book, she says, Jesus is in everybody's hearts. And the person who has rejected Jesus, he is lying in the tomb in their hearts. But what does Jesus do when he's in the tomb? He resurrects. So it's like every human being on the planet has that divine dimension within their heart. Some of us may have rejected it. We may are running away from it. We try to suppress it. We wish it weren't there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it is just lying dormant, looking for that opportunity to blossom yet again. So, um, you know, if you really take that theology seriously, then, you know, every human being, to, to quote Thomas Merton, shines like the sun or potentially shines like the sun which I think would have some interesting theological implications for Christianity and the world at large. We could talk about some of that as well. So, um, so back to Thurman. Um, on the one hand, you know, he, he's a Baptist preacher, you know, Baptist preacher from Florida, black Baptist preacher. On the other hand, he was somebody who was really steeped into this deeply silent approach to spirituality. And as I'm sure you're familiar, you know, the African-American Baptist church is a very exuberant, extroverted kind of worship style. So Thurman was a bit of an outlier, but um, but he was he was deeply loved, and um, and you know the, probably his his most enduring contribution to American society is he mentored Martin Luther King Jr. So in many ways, you know he was you know one of the guiding lights of the civil rights movement, and so. Um, so, you know, most people recognize that at least, you know, in the 1950s and the 1960s, the civil rights movement had a very strong anchoring in the Christian faith. 
but it had a strong anchoring in the contemplative dimension of the Christian faith, which um, Howard Thurman really kind of represents. There's a beautiful scene in the movie Selma. I don't know if this is historical or not. There's a beautiful scene where uh, Martin Luther King Jr. And, and his community of activists are trying to cross the Pettus Bridge. And all the white cops are lined up there with their dogs and their, you know, their sticks. And they kneel and they pray. And it's just silent. All you can hear is like the birds singing. And then Martin Luther King Jr. stands up and says, we need to turn around. You know, he listened to his heart and his heart told him, no, you know, you're just walking into violence right now. And, and the movie even shows people being critical of him. People like were confused by that. But I see that as really uh, kind of acknowledging the contemplative dimension of that, that, you know, that important moment in, in American history. And of course, they eventually did cross the bridge. They eventually did face some violence, but maybe the violence wasn't quite as bad. You know, I mean, that's, that's the thing we can kind of, kind of hope and, and pray, pray about. So, um, so that's Howard Thurman. Yes. I mean, one of the big gaps of the first edition of the book is he's not mentioned such an important figure. Um, so I do make a point to, you know, that, that he shows up repeatedly in the new book. Um, you know, and so, um, you know, and obviously not the only, not the only new edition, but one very important one. In fact, I would argue that, that, that the two most important American mystics of the 20th century are Howard Thurman and Thomas Merton. And Thurman, of course, American born, uh, Merton was an immigrant. So, um, so maybe Thurman really gets pride of place there. Well, thank you for that. Um... I want to go back to a word you used a couple of minutes ago. You wrote meaningful and consistent contact with the divine, I think. And the word consistent jumped out at me because I think that that's also something that people have a lot of misunderstandings about mysticism, that it's like a, you know, that it's a rare occurrence, that it's something really um, special or weird. And also that goes to even our conversation about Martin Luther King Jr. and Howard Thurman. You know, these are incredibly special figures like mysticism is only for the elite, and I think that that ties into a conversation that we were having before we started recording, which is people also have that criticism of Christianity. Um, I was just saying before we we um, we started recording that I quoted Carl in, in two of my books, including in Falling Red Bird, my first one, and a passage, perhaps you can read from your new book, I know we found it earlier, um, about this idea that, you know, that, that Jesus is elite, right? That God poured God's self into Jesus and, but, you know, that's not accessible to us mere mortals. So can you just speak to sort of how mysticism responds to that? Um, sure. That critique, but also is mysticism just for the special few? And the short answer to that is no mysticism is for everybody. Um, there, there is a quote and I, I've never been able to find out who said it first. I've seen it attributed to several different people. Uh, for example, to Brother David Stendhal Rast, who's a wonderful Benedictine um, a monk who's a spiritual writer, and, and at least one or two other people. But the quote goes like this, a mystic is not a special kind of person. Each person is a special kind of mystic. I think that's really, really important. A mystic is not a special kind of person. That's the elitist argument. Each person is a special kind of mystic. So I, I yes, I, I said that that the experience of God, there's a consistency to the experience of God, and I, I believe that. But I think there's also a rich diversity. Um, you know, the analogy would be, you know, to be human means you have a mind, you have a heart, you have a skeleton, you're in flesh. But as we all know, everybody's thumbprints and fingerprints are unique. Everybody's DNA strand is unique. And so everybody's personalities are, are so gloriously unique and different. And yet we also know that there are certain patterns that, that you know, I mean, a person who struggles with depression, there are certain patterns that show up in their psyche or a person that struggles with anxiety it's, and so forth. And so, you know, so it's the same thing. I think it was C.S. Lewis who once said that, you know, that, that sin is very boring and, and how repetitive it is. And yet sainthood is, is infinitely diverse. So I think there's, that's something fun we could play with. But let me read that quote. This is, of course, from, from the second edition. So it may be slightly different from, um, from how, it, uh, how you quoted it in your book. But it goes like this. Some people might object 
that Christianity sets up some sort of two-tiered system that distinguishes between Jesus and lesser mortals. This criticism stems from a profound misunderstanding of Christian wisdom, however, and totally ignores the mystical understanding of Christianity as partaking of the divine nature. God poured the fullness of divinity into Mary's womb, and so Jesus was born, who in turn pours the fullness of Christ's divinity into each and every Christian through the power of the Spirit. We are not mere spectators of the presence of God. Through the fully human and fully divine paradox of Christ, we partake of that very presence. So, um, so I, you know, Jesus himself is quoted in, in the Gospel of John is quoted as saying, the Father and I are one. You know, gendered language, but that's what you got. Um, Jesus is one with the fullness of God. But, and, and the Bible is never that blunt. But the Bible does make it very clear that the community of faith is the body of Christ. Jesus says, abide in me as I abide in you. And so there's this kind of mutual abiding, this mutual kind of co-inhering that goes on here. So kind of do the math. Christ is one with God. We collectively are one with Christ. So it's back to that divine presence in our hearts. And so... Um, so, you know, the, um, to, to enter into the fullness of Christian wisdom teaching is to enter into the fullness of our own, again, to quote, uh, in this case, Peter, our own participation in the divine nature. And that is a bold statement. And a lot of Christian theology, kind of, you know, mainstream garden variety, what you hear preached in your neighborhood church kind of Christianity tends to stress this idea of separation. This idea that God is up there, we are down here, and there's this big rip in the fabric of the universe called sin, and that that sin has separated us. And, and Jesus, by the virtue of his death and resurrection, somehow manages to create a bridge across that, that chasm of sin that those of us who are lucky enough to say yes to Jesus, we get to cross that and we get to be with God. I understand that theology, and I understand that there is certainly um, there is certainly language in Scripture and certainly in, in the history of, of Christian thought to support that kind of language, but it's not the only way of seeing the world. It's not the only, only Christian way of seeing the world. And so I think it's really important to recognize, and this is where Brian McLaren has been so helpful to me, because Brian, more than anyone else, has said, you know, a lot of that kind of worldview, that kind of fall and redemption worldview really does come out of Greek philosophy. You know, you think about, about uh, some of the, the, the philosophers, the Neoplatonic philosophers like Plotinus. Um, I've also heard it pronounced Plotinus. Okay, so if, if, if I, I, my name, everybody mispronounces it. So I get to mispronounce Plotinus. You say Plotinus, I say Plotinus. <laughs> Let's call the whole thing philosophy. But um, however you pronounce his name, um, the, the reality is, is there is this, this kind of dualistic tradition in Greek thought that does stress this idea of a separation between the created world and, and God, the immovable God, who the impassibility of God they talk about, who's up there in God's heaven, away from all the dirt and grime of, of material existence. That doesn't really track well with what we see in the Hebrew scriptures. You know, the Hebrew scriptures, you get much more this sense of a God who is intimately involved in just, you know, the dirt and the dust and the ordinary stuff of being alive. And that's who Jesus is. Jesus is in that tradition. That's why Jesus was a healer. That's why Jesus was engaged in dealing with the poorest of the poor, the, you know, the Anoim, the forgotten people, you know, concerned about issues of justice and issues of of meaning and purpose in people's lives and women accused of adultery and Jesus ministers to them. You know, he heals a child and what does he do? He gets some food and feeds the child. There's always this, this down to earth tenderness in, in how Jesus embodies his spirituality. And so, um, so I think the, the mystical tradition at its best, and, and let me be clear, there are certainly plenty of mystical voices within Christianity that do kind of fall into that more dualistic way of thinking. 
But I think at its best, mystical Christianity really does see the world not in terms of this dualistic split, but in terms of this kind of non-dual or integral wholeness where, um, you know, we're not bad people that somehow God, you know, kind of annoyingly saves us. We are good people who, who are prone to make mistakes. We're, we're we, you know, most of us are broken in some way, shape, or form. Most of us are wounded. The world that we live in is a world that is not a perfect world, not in, in that kind of Greek philosophical way. And that's the world that God has created, and that's the world that we have been given. And it's the world in which we are invited to, um, to live and to love and to build relationships and to try to, to right wrongs and to make things better. And then, you know, the, I think Christianity at its best, and certainly the contemplative dimension of Christianity at its best, all says God is right there in the middle of it, with us and in us and through us, to, to make this a world, a world of joy, a world of, of creativity and love and, and delight. And that's what it's all about, ultimately. Well, thank you so much for that. You know, as you know, um, Carl, I'm in discernment for potential ordination um, to the priesthood in the Episcopal Church. And so I feel like I'm getting an important theological lesson before I even start seminary. This is great. No, this is so good. I'm, I'm taking notes. Um, I have a full page of notes because I'm just really love. I love what you're saying. Um, mm -hmm. So one thing you said, which I think was, you know, you meant as an aside, but I honed in on it because um, in the, in the spirit of my discernment journey, which, you know, I'm on, I preached the other day for the second time ever. And my mom came and my mom and I joke that she's kind of my foil. So she just cannot get over the fact that her daughter is a Christian. She's still not over the fact, even though it's been so many years. And so um, again, it came up and, and she told my husband, apparently now I'm outing her on a, on a podcast about this, um, that she, you know, just is so bothered by the gendered language in the church. And so you said, yeah. Um, you're quoting Jesus and talking about, um, you know, and he refers, I think partly for me, it's helpful to know that he talks about God as Abba, which is, I think, such a soft word. Maybe you can talk about that. But, you know, just in general, how, and it's not totally about mysticism, but how do you deal with gender in in your book? And how, do, how would you respond to somebody like my mom who just has uh, sort of a thorn in their side, so to speak, about this gendered language issue? Sure. Sure. Well, um, the first thing I would say is I agree with her. Um, it is it is frustrating, and it all religion, not just Christianity, all religion has a conservative element by it. And by conservative, I'm not talking about like republicanism, like our modern political idea. I'm talking about philosophically. It tends to emphasize tradition. It tends to be slow to change, um, and so. I mean, you run into this in, in other, other faith traditions as well. I mean, look at Islam, look at, at uh, some of the Hindu writings or the Buddhist writings, the sutras. Again and again and again, you find uh, older language tends to be patriarchal language because there is basically about a 5,000 year period, the beginning of written history pretty much globally. Um, and certainly whenever there was any kind of an empirical, an imperial government, and we know, you know, China was imperial. There was uh, there were monarchies in India. Obviously, the Roman Empire. You know, imperialism has been a stage in the global development of the human family, and imperialism, I think, without exception, has always been patriarchal. So the first thing I would say to your mom is, show me language from the first couple of centuries of the Common Era that isn't patriarchal. I don't think it exists. I think it's just there. That's the world in which Christianity was born. So, so we have to kind of, you know, acknowledge that that's our past. We can critique it, we can challenge it, we can talk about how limited it is, but if we just dismiss it altogether, we're dismissing our own history. And I don't think that's the most skillful response. So, um, you know, so that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is that I think Jesus himself is remarkable for his time in how he was affirming of women. Um, 
you know, it's interesting because there's the gospel writers present the, the apostles, the 12 apostles as all men, but Jesus didn't write those. And so I think it's a fair question. Was that projection on the part of his followers who basically filtered out the women who were probably just as much part of the inner circle as the men? Because the reality is, is if you look at the different gospels, the, the 12 names don't match. <laughs> you know, there's this idea, we have to have 12 apostles because there were 12 tribes of Israel. It's like um, that there was a symmetry yeah. there, you know, 12 <laughs> tribes of Israel, 12, 12 apostles. But who were the 12? You know, it's like the, the different evangelists offer up different kind of slates. And so you, you even have commentators over history trying to match them, you know, Bartholomew and I think it was Thaddeus or whatever are really the same person, you know, and, and that kind of thing. And that, you know, that's just trying to explain away. But still, so, so really the argument could, I think there's a credible argument that could say the women who kind of show up on the margins in the text might very well have had a much stronger role than, than the text has Give it, led us to believe. So that's the first point. The second point is I already mentioned Jesus and the woman accused of adultery. You know, Jesus's willingness to engage, you know, the woman at the well. I mean, it was scandalous for a man to just sit and have a conversation with an unaccompanied woman. Did that bother Jesus? Not in the least. I mean, he just, you know, he was thirsty. He was like, hey, can I have a cup of water? And then they chat, you know? And so, so it's clear that he he already is willing to step out of some of the gender stereotypes and the, you know, which, which tended to more regulate the lives of women than the lives of men uh, at that time. So, so there are some tantalizing clues within, within the, the, the text itself of the Bible that indicate that we don't have to just accept the interpretation of the Jesus story the way that the most conservative voices in Christianity would have us accept it. And so, you know, so like I would say to your, to your mom, if I was talking to your mom, I'd say, why don't you get a copy of the women's co Bible commentary and the queer Bible commentary? And then maybe also a post-colonial commentary, which tries to read the Bible, not from Eurocentric, American-centric eyes, but from the eyes of people in Africa or people in Asia or other parts of the world who read the text very differently. So in many ways, I think her criticism is maybe also a criticism of the patriarchy in our culture because we read the text through that lens. And so, um, you know, so, so I'd say, yeah, I'm all with you with your criticism, but, but you need to look at the whole story before you just be dismissive. Well, thank you for that. I'm gonna have my mom listen to this and she, uh... <laughs> Hopefully she'll then give her my email, right? And then she'll write to me. <laughs> okay. If you have any follow up, talk to Carl. I love it. I love it. Well, and so maybe since this is now um, a family affair, I could bring my brother Chris into the conversation because I hear my cat, um, Marpa, who's named after a Buddhist, by the way, meowing in the background. And I'm reminded that Julian of Norwich was a cat person, right? And I, um, and I, I don't know the backstory on that. Do you know, can you tell us briefly? And also, um, you know, do you see, again, if we're talking about critiques of criticism, my brother Chris is a vegan activist and he mm -hmm. really um, takes offense at the idea that we have a human-centric, you know, not recognizing all of creation. And so does, can you, you know, again, I know we're supposed to be talking about, well, we're also talking about compassion. So maybe can you talk about, um, you know, how do animals play into all this? Another sure, sure. Well, um, there is, um, yeah, let's see. So that's, that's, that's more than one question. Let's, let's. So Maybe you can start with Julian. Why did Julian, did, okay. through the yeah, Julian okay. so cat? It's, so it's folklore about Julian and the cat. It's actually folklore, but it's reasonable folklore. So for, for listeners and viewers who may not be familiar with Julian, she was a mystic. She lived in the 14th century in Norwich, England. Um, she was a visionary. She had these 16 visions of Jesus and of Mary and you know the devil. I mean, all, all kind of garden variety religious imagery, but then she interprets them and her interpretation is just vivid and beautiful. And 
very theologically ahead of its time. In fact, in some ways, she's still very cutting edge, even 650 years later. This is actually the 650th anniversary of her visions. Her visions were in 1373, we're now in 2023. Um, the, um, Julia never says whether she has a cat or not, but she was an anchoress and an anchoress was a person who lived a solitary life, a consecrated solitary life, usually attached to a parish church. So not like a, a nun who would have lived with a community of nuns or not like a true hermit who would tend to live in a remote location, like off in the woods somewhere. But an anchoress is kind of like an in-between vocation living a solitary life, but still living in the midst of kind of a community. And so that, we don't even know the woman's real name. She was the anchoress at the Church of St. Julian in Norwich. And that's how she's come to be known as Julian of Norwich. Um, the rule for anchoresses, the rule of life, does not permit anchoresses to have dogs, but does permit them to have cats. And so it's really based on that, that cat lovers have just run with this and have said, well, obviously Julian had cats because <laughs> it's very clear that Julian <laughs> loves nature and loves animals. And, you know, she has that kind of, kind of you know, very, again, incarnational heart. So, um, so it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing, but here's, let me say this real quick. And then this actually would be a good way to segue into the second part of your question. Evelyn Underhill, who I mentioned earlier, the author of the book, Mysticism, was a notorious cat lover. None of her books does she ever mention it, but in her letters, the cats dance all through them. She is constantly talking about her cats. And she, you know, you can kind of imagine this Edwardian lady, very stiff upper lip, and she's writing this letter and she's talking about theology and spirituality. And, uh, and then at the very end, she starts talking about mittens. And she's like, oh, mittens is, mittens is chasing the mices today. You know, I'm, I'm there, I'm just making this up. But that's the kind of tonality. Suddenly this, this big heart opens up and this, this love for, for animals. When her book came out, her first book came out, she got a very favorable review in one of the, the, the newspapers in London. It would have been the Times or the Guardian, you know, one of the newspapers. And she's writing a letter to her husband and she mentions this review. She says, so the book was favorably reviewed and I am purring. <laughs> so, so that's that's Evelyn Underhill. So if you want a cat lover, we, we've got much more solid Evelyn. You know, I, I certainly love it that Julian is associated with cats, but Evelyn Underhill, the evidence is incontrovertible. Now, speaking of cats and speaking of Evelyn Underhill, Evelyn Underhill also corresponded with a certain man named C.S. Lewis. In, now, Underhill dies in 1941. Lewis, she, Lewis was a fan of hers, and he, he would send her his books when they were published, and then she would write back and kind of offer her thoughts on the book. So he sent her uh, Out of the Silent Planet. I know he sent her at least two. He sent her Out of the Silent Planet. He sent her The Problem of Pain. He may have sent her others. Well, in one of her letters, it's only a few months before she dies, she writes to him, and apparently, I've never read The Problem of Pain. But apparently in that book, he makes some sort of a comment that he thinks domesticated animals are closer to God than wild animals. And Evelyn Underhill is having none of it. She basically, and pardon my very vulgar language, but we would say she ripped him a new one. She just she just lays him flat. And basically, I, I, if I had the book here, I would read it to you, but, but it's in the letters of Evelyn Underhill. She basically goes on and on and on about how, you know, an, an animal in a cage is not closer to God. It's just, it's, it's just there to, 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 to serve humans. It is, it is anthropocentric, blah, 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 blah. And that, you know, it's intolerable that you would actually think that is a good arrangement. And she ends this tirade by basically saying, you need an image of God with more wildness in it. Now, wow. she dies six months later. Oh my gosh. His letter back to her is very defensive, very brief and very defensive. But about five years after that, he starts writing a children's book wow. where a lion is the image of Christ. 
And they very clearly say in the book, he is not a tame lion. Wow. And so I, I have no evidence beyond that one letter, but I really like to think, and if heaven is the kind of place where you can go and interview people, by gum, I'm going to ask you to listen. <laughs> um, I like to think that letter planted the seed for Aslan in C.S. Lewis's mind. Wow. And that, you know, that his, his mature image of this wild, free animal image of Christ probably began with that lecture from Evelyn Underhill, that literary lecture in 1940 or 41, whenever it was. So, well, my cat's going your... crazy in the background. So I think you're onto something. I think he's saying amen. <laughs> yeah, he's, he, he, he's, he's picking up the vibe. Yeah, he um, is. Back, so back to your brother. Once again, I would say Christianity is not the only religion that suffers from anthropocentrism. That is, that's certainly true. But I would say, you know, look at, look at Francis of Assisi. Look at Hildegard of Bingen. Look at Teilhard de Chardin. Look at Ilia Delio. Look at Thomas Berry. There is a tremendous tradition within Christianity. And of course, several of those voices, Judy Canato, several of those voices are contemporary voices. Um, you know, Teilhard died in 1955. And then Ilia Delio is still alive. Judy Canato died a few years ago. She had cancer. She died young. Uh, Thomas Berry just died after a long life. But, um, you know, there is certainly... There is certainly a stream within Christian spirituality that is trying very much to interrogate that humanist centrism that, again, I think is just, just reflects where humanity was at the time this religion was born. And so, of course, that's a, that's a problem within the religion. And so it, you, you can ask the question, does that mean we just chuck the religion or do we work to, to reform? to make it better. Uh, you know, I may be Catholic, but I'm also a big believer in Semper Reforma, you know, that, that the Holy Spirit is continually reforming the body of Christ. We are continually growing and evolving. You know, I'm, I'm a strong ally of, of queer Christians. I'm a strong believer of full equality and inclusion for LGBTQIA folks. Um, and I realize that is something that has emerged just within the last, what, 100 years or so. And, and I am absolutely convinced that it is the movement of the Holy Spirit in our time. And I'm sorry a lot of Christians think that's controversial. I would commend them to prayer. But, you know, but again, it's, you know, as recently as 1889, the Catholic Church was still saying slavery was permissible. That is scandalous. Thank God, by, you know, by the, the turn of the 20th century, the, the weight of opinion within Catholicism had shifted. But it just shows how long it took for the Holy Spirit to work on the community of faith, to, um, to let go of ideas that people just accepted, but that I think are clearly inconsistent with what God wants of humanity. So, I, you know, one of the things about being a writer, I'm a lay person. Uh, I, I did not go to seminary. But I still have a bit of the preacher in me, and I. You, you do. Know, it's, I it's, love it. It's, a, you know, it's an I, occupational I'm hazard. That. But <laughs> I'm thinking you have a well, either that or a family therapist, because we're going to a family reunion this weekend, and my um, my father is actually Roman Catholic, and he and he and my mother are still happily married. They're celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary this, wow, this summer. So, um, so you could come and do some potentially retreat for our, for our extended family and address all these questions and more. And we could also buy your book. So maybe this is a good place to end. And okay. um, and just to say, I again, I feel like we could go forever, but just in the in the spirit of time, um, can you hold up your book again? Give me another mm -hmm. chance to say your and, last name. And let Carl, me just um oh let me give let me have another chance to say your name. Carl McCollman. Okay. Mm -hmm. The new big book of Christian mysticism, an essential guide to contemplative spirituality. Yes. And and, and can I just take 30 more seconds yeah. before we wrap up because I realize there may be people who have the first edition mm -hmm. and they're going to ask, well, why should I buy the second edition? So we've taught, we've talked about some of it, you know, that I've tried yeah. to have a broader palette. Um, I, I have tried to use more inclusive language. Um, the, there are five new chapters addressing topics such as sexuality, social justice, um, extended versions of pre-existing chapters, a much more in-depth, uh, exploration of the Jewish, the Jewish and Old Testament contribution 
to Christian mysticism. And basically, as you and I were talking before we started recording, I literally every sentence in the book was reread, reconsidered, oftentimes rewritten. So it is in many ways a new book. And um, I think people who've read the first book, they'll recognize it, but there's a lot of new material. It, it, just the length, the first edition was 97,000 words. The new edition is 140, I think no, 94,000 to 140,000. So it's essentially 50% longer. So it's- Well, I can't wait. I'm so excited. Yeah. I'm so, ha and I'm, I'm happy to have both. And again, your book made such a difference to me in my own conversion journey. So I'm so grateful. Can you tell us where, so I know it's coming out in August of 2023. Right. Can you tell us where and where and when we can get it? Yeah, well, it's being published by Broadleaf Books, which of course is part of 1517, which is Fortress Press, Augsburg Fortress, that whole crowd. So it's a major Christian publisher, which means, you know, all the usual, you know, Barnes and Noble, Amazon, uh, Books A Million, Christian Book Distribution, all your independent bookstores will either have it or can easily order it. Um, of course, I'm on my website, if you want an autographed copy, you can order it through my website, which is anamkara.com. That's A-N-A-M-C-H-A-R-A.com. Um, and um, yeah, you know, wherever wherever books are sold, you could probably special order if they don't have it in stock. So. Well, congratulations, blessings on this launch and on this huge, you know, just really thanks be to God for this huge major rewrite and um, new offering to the world. I'm so excited for you. I can't wait to get my own copy and continue to spread the word. So, um, and I love this conversation. So I hope you'll come back and we can have another one, at, another conversation at some point. But in the meantime, blessings, check out Carl's new book um, in August, 2023. The, the big, the new big book of Christian mysticism. Yes. All right. Thanks again, Carl. Really fun. Thank you. you. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Uh -huh. Peace.